So hello everyone. So welcome back. So I can see maybe people still joining us and maybe someone got a bit hangover because the last night the dinner was so good. But I, I think we should uh, keep on time. So let's begin with the first session of the oral uh, session today will be chaired by Soren. Sorry. Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, we have three talks, each uh, 15 minutes and five <coughs> minutes for questions. And the first talk is by um, Xiao Chuan Li about uh, privacy preserving and communication efficient information enhancement for imbalanced medical imaging classification. Um, if you're ready, uh, I would hand over to you. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Xiao Chuan Li. I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Georgia uh, from the statistics department. Um, and unfortunately, because the pandemic and my visa issue and I have, I cannot attend the conference in person. So finally, I choose to present virtually. Let's get started. Uh, so my presentation's title is Privacy Preserving and Communication Efficient Information Enhancement for Imbalanced Medical Image Classification. Uh, let's get started. Um, here is a brief outline of this presentation, and I will first introduce uh, the motivation and the challenges of this project, and followed by the introduction of the data, the method we used, and after that, I will describe the problem setup and the experiments, and finally, the experiment results and conclusion. So this project is, in general, a medical image classification problem. And there are many different types of medical images. And in this project, uh, the type of medical imaging used is the chest X-ray image, and which is typically used to diagnose lung disease, such as pneumonia. And unlike some other natural images, such as animal images, dog versus cat, and medical image data sets usually have several features. And these features may cause additional challenges in their analyzing processes. So for example, firstly, medical images are in general expensive and time consuming to collect. And therefore the sample sizes of the medical image uh, data sets are small. And secondly, we can always observe class imbalance in medical image data sets. And other than that, medical images also contain sensitive and the private information of patients. And usually due to the privacy restrictions and the privacy uh, policy concerns, hospitals and the, medical image, uh, and the medical institutions are not willing to publish or share their medical images. So even though they can share the format, the size, the quality and annotation of the images from different sources may have huge differences. Because of these features, we may face some challenges in medical image classification. Since hospitals are unwilling to share and the images from multiple sources can be very different, then augmenting medical images from various sources to have a bigger data set may not always be realistic. So for, for example, for natural images, if we have two data sets of dog images, we can easily combine them and then we can have a bigger data set, but that will not always be the case in medical image data sets. So afterwards, as the sample size is small, then training a deep convolutional neural network classification model with randomly initialized weights can be luxury and lead to unsatisfactory results. So the goal of our research is to overcome these challenges and propose a privacy preserving and communication efficient information enhancement procedure for medical image classification. So let's move on to the data description. Here we have two data sets. Uh, one is the target data set, uh, which is a small and heavily imbalanced chest X-ray image data set. 
So we use it to study the binary classification. And the other data set is the source data set. And it mimics the situation that there exists another big, bigger data set collected by another hospital or situation or institution from which we can borrow some information. So these two data sets used here differs from each other in many aspects. So firstly, the data sources, the target data set is collected from a women and children's hospital in China. The source data set is published by the National Institution of Health Clinical Center in the USA. And secondly, the images in the target data set are of patients under five years old, while the patients in the source data sets are from all age groups. And besides, the labels are different. The two classes in the target data sets are normal and pneumonia, while the classes in the source data set are no funding and infiltration. And lastly, the target data set is small and imbalanced to mimic the situation discussed uh, in the last slide, uh, but source data set is large and balanced. And in this slide, I listed uh, several images from the classes in each data set. So the domain difference between these two data sets is visually recognizable. The target data set images are from kids under five years old, and these images are visually more clear than those in the source data set. So that will be the data sets we're going to use. And let's move on to the methods. So the goal of our research is to propose a privacy preserving and a communication efficient information enhancement procedure. And this procedure mainly contains two components, transfer learning and generative models. So transfer learning uh, is used here to alleviate the data insufficient problem by giving the model training a warm start. So, so that we don't need to train a convolutional neural network model from scratch. And the other component is generative models. And our research proposed to boost the minority class with artificial images. Here we consider two representative types of generative models, guns and autoencoders. So in total, four generative models have been implemented here, including DC gun, Wasserstein gun, conditional gun, and variational autoencoder. And that would be the two major components of our procedure. And as for the problem setup, so to mimic the situation discussed in the beginning of this presentation, the target data set is randomly partitioned into three sets, training, validation, and testing. And the validation and the testing sets are designed to be balanced to evaluate the classification performance, while the training set is intentionally left severely imbalanced. And the classification model that will be used throughout the whole project is going to be a modified VGG16 model. And the architecture is shown in the below picture. And the input is the single channel grayscale X-ray images. And the final output is the probability the input image having pneumonia. So based on these, we further designed five experiments. So the first experiment is treated as the baseline, trained from scratch on the imbalanced data set. And this baseline model will be also used uh, in other experiments, and I will talk about that later. And besides the baseline model, the next is going to be information enhancement by the source data set. Two experiments have been designed under this category. And in experiment four, we, uh, in experiment two, we augment no funding images from the source data set to the, norm, to the normal class in the target data set. Here, normal class is the minority class in our target data set. Because according to the label description, no funding indicates that the X-ray image does not show visible character, characteristic of a lung disease, which means the image is normal. So according to the label description, we 
we consider augment our minority class using the no funding images. And uh, in experiment three, we borrow the information from the source data set via transfer learning. So we first separate the source data set into training and validation. And afterward, pre-train the classification model with the same architecture on the source data set. And eventually fine tune the weights of all the layers over the imbalanced target training set. With that being said, uh, the imbalanced target training set is going to be 800 normal images versus uh, 3,500 pneumonia, uh, pneumonia uh, images. And next, we consider an alternative information enhancement strategy by artificial sample. So in experiment four, we propose to augment artificial normal images generated by the generative model to the normal class. And uh, finally, in our last experiment, experiment five, we combined artificial sample and transfer learning strategies to form our privacy preserving and a communication efficient information enhancement procedure. So the procedure contains three steps. And firstly, augment the minority class, which is going to be normal class with uh, 2,700 artificial images generated by the best generative model. And secondly, transfer learning, initialize the weights of the classification model by the parameters transferred from the model pre-trained on the source data set. And thirdly, fine tune all layers over the balanced target training set. Um, with that being said, balanced target training set is uh, 3,500 normal images versus 3,500 uh, pneumonia images. And those will be the experiment we designed. And as I mentioned before, the baseline model is also used in other experiments. So the first usage here is to evaluate the domain difference between the source and the target data set. So we feed the images from the two classes in the source data set into our baseline model, and which was trained in the experiment one. And output probabilities are shown in the plot with smoothed density curves. And recall that output probabilities represents the probability that an input image is likely to be labeled as pneumonia. So according to this plot, both no funding and infiltration classes in the source data set have histograms heavily skewed to one. And meaning that most of the images in the source data set will be classified to the pneumonia class. And this shows a clear domain difference between the source and the target data sets. But we, uh, but we still can borrow some information um, that is going to be our experiment two and experiment three uh, in our five, uh, out of our five experiments. Another usage of the baseline model is to evaluate the quality of the artificial normal images generated by different generative models. So the plot on the left displays some artificial normal images generated by the four generative models. So among the four methods, the artificial images generated by DC gun are visually most clear and the closest to the authentic normal images. So similar to what we did in the last slide, we fit those artificial images into the baseline model and computed their prediction probabilities. So from the right plot here, and three GAN-based models work better as their distributions are centered around zero. Uh, here, um, centered around zero, meaning that they are predicting their uh, input images as normal images. And furthermore, the artificial uh, sample generated by DC GAN specifically has the smallest standard deviation. So therefore, finally, the artificial normal images generated by DC GAN was used in experiment four. So um, now let's have a look at our experiment, uh, experiment results. So this table summarizes and compares the prediction results 
of the five classification models over the same testing images. The first row in the table represents the baseline model, which uses neither transfer learning nor data augmentation. So the baseline model has a classification accuracy of 84%. And besides the baseline has one false positive that is misclassifying normal to pneumonia and 137 false negative that is misclassifying pneumonia to normal. And the performance of the baseline model is not ideal because nearly one third of the pneumonia pictures in the testing set have been misdiagnosed as normal. The second and third rows show the prediction results of the models that borrow information from the source data set. So you may notice that in the second experiment, we have a reputation of seven because this experiment involves data augmentation which means we need to take random sampling. So to account for variability, we repeated the experiment seven times. The accuracy displayed here is the average value over, over these seven times um, experiments. And other than that, we have another column, you may notice um, that is called communication cost. And it indicates the size of the file needed to be transferred when borrowing information. So experiment two uses a naive data augmentation approach as the medical images are usually of high quality. So therefore the communication cost can be very high because we need to transfer those real medical images. And the file size is over 7.7 .7 gigabytes in our research and then moreover, uh, in reality, due to the privacy concerns, directly borrowing, uh, directly borrowing images as what we did in experiment two may not be real, uh, may not be available. So compared to experiment two, experiment three achieves a similar prediction accuracy and a much lower communication cost, which is 200 megabytes here, because we do not need to transmit any images, but only the model weights. You have about half a minute left. Sorry about that. Okay, sure. And finally, the best model is experiment five, which uses both transfer learning and data augmentation with artificial samples generated by DCGAN. So compared to the baseline model, it achieves a classification accuracy of 95%, increased by over 10%, and reduced the average false negative to around 31. And as well, it is communication efficient and can preserve patient's privacy because during the procedure, we do not need to transmit any real images. So at the end of the presentation, let me make a quick conclusion. So our approach, our research proposed a, pri a, pri a privacy preserving and communication efficient information in hospital procedure. And this procedure have two um, components, transfer learning and artificial sampling by generative models. And it improved the prediction accuracy by more than 10%, preserved the privacy of the patients, and is communication efficient. And that would be all for my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah, thank you so much for your talk. Do we have one question or so maybe in the audience? Otherwise, we have one in the chat. Um, um, Greg uh, asks, um, could your method be extended to multi-class problems? Oh yeah, that is a really a good question. And uh, that would be um, in my paper, I listed in my future work. And uh, in the future, I will think about how to extend them into the multi-class. Um, and uh, that is a very good question, I think. Uh, we can discuss more uh, offline, probably. OK, great. Thank you so much for this very interesting talk. Um, the next talk is by um, Hassan Pokan Kaya. Um, Kaya, sorry about that. Um, about non-iterative blind deblurring of digital microscopy images with spatially varying blur. Um, if you like, you can try to share your slides. Exactly. Hello, so do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you and we can see not the full screen slides, but we can see yeah. the screen slides. 
I am doing it full screen now. And, okay. So whenever so, you're ready. Yeah, I will start now. Thank you very much. So hello everyone. My name is Furkan, and today I will present uh, our work. It's called Non-Iterative Blind Deblurring of Digital Microscope Images with Spatially Varying Blur. So here's a short overview of my uh, presentation. I'll start with a motivation and go on to the problem modeling part. Then I'll, pr I'll um, present our proposed solution along with the experimental results with images and a video. And I will conclude here uh, with, a, with a short conclusion. So what's the motivation of our work? Um, so there are digital microscopes which are used for operations, so surgical operations. And uh, the, these microscopes have mostly diffraction limited systems and this uh, limits the resolution. So here is an example of um, uh, a mic digital microscope that we work with. So it's, a, it's called Ariscope. And uh, as I said, it's a diffraction limited system and diffraction, this optical uh, phenomenon limits the uh, resolution. And, uh, but one advantage here that we can use is that the digital microscopes as opposed to um, optical, uh, purely optical microscopes have the ability to be able to process the images uh, digitally. And we can use this, uh, this feature to improve this um, resolution, uh, optical resolution. Um, and to improve the um, surgical operation by, by enhancing the image. So what's the, uh, here there you see an image coming from the, this digital microscope, iriscope. And as you see here in the pattern, there are numbers, but they are not very um, sharp. So this, this is also a zoomed in version. It was a bigger image, but you see that uh, the details are not very sharp because of this diffraction limitation, which is happening naturally. So uh, if you consider the sensor cells, image sensor cells, and the optical point spread function in this case will be larger than the sensor cells that, that brings this um, image, um, this, that brings this blur into the image because of this um, diffraction. So in, in our work, we improve, we improve this uh, image by deblurring it. And then our aim is um, improving surgical operations in general. So I'm starting with the problem modeling part. Here we uh, model this uh, image blurring or image degradation problem, if you like, uh, like this. So we have an I latent image, which we want to estimate. And we have a P point spread function, which is convolved with this image. And we have additive noise here as a model. So here is the degraded image G that we observe. And this is a typical convolution. And, and then additive noise expression here, mathematical expression of what I explained. And our aim is obtaining I hat. Um, the problem is that this is a severely ill posed problem. This is an inverse problem. And um, so uh, we, we may need uh, some special regularization or assumptions here. But uh, what, what you see here is um, a P, what you see here is that the P, this blur kernel, is uh, not changing even during, along the image. So it's constant, but this is also not a realistic uh, model in that case, because in reality, the uh, objects have different uh, distance to optics. So they have different, uh, they are not in the, all in the focus plane. And also uh, these microscopes have narrow depth of field. So the focus plane is really um, covering a short area in the image most, most of the time. So we don't really know, um, the, uh, the uh, blur level in general. So the blur also varies uh, specially along the image. So it's, it's now an even more complicated problem to estimate I because now uh, it's not only um, uh, we estimate um, a P blindly without uh, depending on the location, but now we also need to estimate maybe locally PSF, this uh, point spread function locally to be able to enhance this image. Okay, so as, as before, this is uh, still a severely ill post problem. It doesn't have a unique uh, solution also. It's not, it doesn't have a stable um, solution. So we have some assumptions to be able to solve this problem. Our first assumption is that uh, if you observe a steep edge profile like this in the image, so it's, it's an edge profile and like intensity levels in the image, we assume that it, was, it had originally a step function form, but it was convolved 
it has, has been uh, convolved with a kernel like this. And then that's why we observe this kind of profile. So we assume this to be able to estimate this uh, kernel, actually. Another assumption we have done, uh, we have taken is that the point spread function, this blur kernel, which is convolved with the uh, image, can be approximated by an isotropic model. So here we deal with this um, um, uh, diffraction limitation problem. So the kernel can be isotropic. Also, uh, in, in the optics, uh, mostly in the central region, this PSF is um, isotropic. So around the borders, it can be slightly non-isotropic, but uh, in, in central region, at least, it's completely um, isotropic. So we assume this. We, we, we assume that we can approximate PSF with this model. So there can be always computational constraints. And for video processing, which is a highly uh, computationally costly operation, uh, we, we want high parallelizability to, to be able to uh, process efficiently. So that's why we prefer local operations in our solution over global operations and global uh, solutions. And uh, when we check the literature, we see that there are many techniques which use classical regularization and uh, also which has iterative solutions like optimization problems by including the entire image in this uh, optimization or optimization um, formulation. The, these are very time consuming and these may also have possible convergence issues. So what we um, propose here is a non-iterative approach. It's a one-shot approach in the sense that uh, this, the, this uh, deep blurring is, has been, is done uh, non-iteratively. So it's in one shot. We locally um, estimate the blur kernel and we locally uh, deconvolve the image with these estimated blur kernels. And then um, we enhance the image uh, with spatially varying blur. Uh, one thing we observed here, so we have selected linear deconvolution, uh, firstly, as uh, our deconvolution method. And then by the naive approach, so you see, an, uh, uh, by the naive approach, we have seen a noise issue I will introduce here. So you see a pattern here that we created uh, artificially. And you see the a profile, like intensity profile here alongside this, along this green uh, line. And we have uh, convolved this with a blur kernel and added some noise. So then PSNR and SSIM values are uh, shown here. So similarity to the original pattern is um, uh, this number uh, given by this matrix. Then if, if we deconvolve this with Wiener deconvolution, what we observe is that the edges are sharper. So uh, the image has a sharper feeling uh, and appearance. However, the um, noise in the flat areas uh, is amplified a lot. So it also brings these uh, artifacts or uh, noise amplification because of the deconvolution. And even though the PSNR increases now, the SSIM metric we see that decreases after deconvolution. So we thought then, why don't we limit this the convolution operation only on the edges or structural details in the image, which, which carry important information? Because uh, deconvolving the flat area doesn't bring us anything else than the noise. So we, we, we created a mask like this. So it's a mask with soft values. It's not binary. And around the edges. And we take, we take these regions, these um, deconvolved regions on these edges. And then in the other parts of this uh, mask, we take the uh, flat regions from the degraded image, and then we combine them together. Then what we observe is that uh, we have uh, very less artifacts now, uh, much less artifacts now only on the uh, edge uh, regions. And in the flat regions, we don't see any artifacts because we don't touch these regions. And then you see this improvement here. So also in objective metrics like PSNR and SSIM, both have uh, been have improved here after this masking. So we use this idea in our in our um, in our solution. So general outline of the proposed solution: we have an RGB input, and um, we we operate in luminous uh, luminous image, uh, and then we create this mask which shows the pixels of interest, and then we estimate the point spread function locally from the edges, and with this estimation we use our inverse filters to deconvolve the image locally. Then we finally combine these two images as I showed on the previous slide. And we, we, we uh, obtain this deblurred luminance image, which we transform back into the RGB, RGB domain. So I will uh, like to uh, explain these steps in more detail. 
a mask for mask extraction, we take the luminous image and we apply an edge aware denoising first. So uh, we, we use a modified version of paranormal diffusion that we propose here. It's single shot and intensive. And we, uh, we use a structure tensor here, which depends on which based on the image gradients. And we create a structure map out of the eigenvalues of the structure tensor. With the, their difference shows a structural um, uh, coherence actually in the lo local area. And at the end, we have an adaptive contrast stretching part to normalize this mask into a zero one interval that will be used later also for um, averaging these two images that we process and we don't process. So we have this adaptive contrast stretching step and then we obtain the mask at the end. Then we, we need to model the PSF and we start with the edge spread function. And uh, so it's we analytically obtain this point spread function uh, with derivative and inverse radiant transform. And we model the point spread function with a 2D Gaussian function. And in that case, then uh, our edge, edge model is a normal uh, cumulative distribution function. So it's given by this expression. And what we need to estimate now on, on at each uh, edge location is this sigma, this standard deviation parameter, which gives us a kind of the um, size of this kernel, a blur kernel. So how do we do that? We get the luminance image, we, we detect the edges, and we extract edge profiles. And then we fit um, this ESF model that we introduced in the previous slide on these edge profiles, on these noisy edge profiles using least square, um, least square minimization. And then we obtain the sigma value, this value at each of these edge locations. So we see, you see a map here, which shows these, um, these sigma values from blue to yellow in, as increasing values, increasing blur level. But what we need now is we need these uh, sigma values in all the mask pixels, not only on the edge locations, but all the mask uh, regions. So we interpolate these edge values with uh, an edge aware interpolation method. And this is our proposed deconvolution filter. So this is similar to Wiener deconvolution. So there's an inverse uh, operator here, inverse filter, and there's a regular regularizer term. And uh, here we introduce uh, an intensity depending SNR uh, value because uh, that's that's coming from the sensor characteristics. So the noise variance uh, changes with the intensity level of the um, of the light. And also we have an alpha here, which is a regularization parameter in the frequency domain. So with this filter, we, we deconvolve the image locally. And uh, at, at, at each local uh, pixel location, we have a different uh, sigma value and different I value. So we select our filters adaptively. And after deconvolving the image, we mask the, uh, the deconvolved image. And uh, then we can also only uh, deconvolve in the mask areas to increase the efficiency. We also did that. And then we average these uh, two images. So the flat regions of, we take the flat regions of the degraded image and the column of regions of this uh, image. And then we combine them into the final uh, image, uh, enhanced image. I would like to show some uh, experiments here with qualitative analysis. So these are microscope images with different characteristics coming from the, uh, from Ariscope. And as you see here, the original image is uh, blurry and we zoom in. And if we take alpha, the regularization parameter alpha is zero, we see that it's deep blurred, but there are strong artifacts on the edges. So when we increase alpha slightly, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, we see that the image is getting sharper and the, and the artifacts disappear. So we think that 0 0.8 is a good um, value in this case. And we, we selected that, that value here. Also uh, in the next slide, you will see this another image with this alpha equal uh, 0 0.8. And uh, I would also like to show you a video now um, um, showing the results of this. Yes. So here you see a sequence coming from an ENT surgery operation. So this uh, during, a real op during a real operation, and this is the original sequence. Now this is the deep blurred sequence. And you see that uh, not only the regions in totally in the focus plane, are deep blurred, but also regions slightly out of the uh, focus plane are deep blurred. And here you see a direct comparison. And I hope you can see the um, difference well in this video, video um, conference. 
Um, when we compare the results, we see that the structural details are much more clear now, and we don't uh, observe any artifacts. So there are, of course, artifacts, but they are limited. And here our aim is not to, uh, not to decrease the image quality by trying to increasing it and then improve the, uh, improve the view, uh, view uh, by deep learning. Here you see the Sigma map we extract and we, you see that around the edges, you have, for instance, for more blurry regions, we have yellow, more yellow uh, color. And for uh, more sharper regions, we have more blue color. So this shows our estimation. Sorry? You have about 30 seconds left, but okay, it okay, looks okay. like you're at the end anyway. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm uh, almost at the end. So this is uh, the end of our video. I just have a single slide for conclusion. Okay, so we propose here a blind deep learning method for digital microscope images to improve this um, uh, diffraction limit and then to improve the image quality. Uh, we have adaptive edge deep learning. So uh, we, we adaptively um, deep blur the edges, especially by locally estimating the PSF and locally deconvolving. It's highly parallelizable due to mainly local operations uh, in the solution. So it's a robust and parameter-free method in the sense that the, uh, when a surgeon uses this method, uh, uh, he or she doesn't have to uh, tune, the, uh, tune the parameters, but just let the methods work because it adapts the image and it, it does its operation in an automatic way. So uh, this is the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, I thank you for your attention and you'd like to get the questions if you have any. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for this interesting talk. Any questions? Hello, uh, thank you very much. I really like this talk actually. Um, just a quick question about uh, like time, con uh, con how much it takes. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is this meant to be, cause you're, you're fitting, like you're, you're detecting all the edges and then you're fitting every edge of the Sigma and everything. Is this supposed to be uh, a live thing during surgery or am I taking a video and then looking at it later to see what I did? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. Here, our aim was uh, finding the methodology mostly. So we didn't uh, create a real-time application. So we of, we of course tried the um, application, but it is just a plain trial in MATLAB. So it doesn't mean anything, but we also didn't try with parallelization. So on special hardware. So we don't have really real-time values here. But uh, what we observe is that the operations on, on the local operations take really very few time. So it's in uh, around microseconds and uh, order. And when we, when we create a real time um, um, method with this uh, parallelization approach with special hardwares or softwares, then it, it really seems that uh, it's feasible to create this real time application to be able to use during this um, operations, but it was not our focus here. Our focus was more on the algorithmic part to be able to um, allow this kind of real-time application. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Okay, we have time for maybe one very quick question. Um, hey, that was really good. Uh, my question is like, I might have just missed it from the explanation but it's a mm -hmm. the definition of deconvolution uh yes. filter this is such a big question but is is there like okay. an intuitive um kind of uh kind of explanation for that formula like a sort mm -hmm. of intuitive mathematical sort sure, of way sure. of picturing that yeah because that yeah. looks like you're trying to there's something intuitive about the denominator there that you're yeah exactly using. so this is an inverse filter actually this is just uh, making the inverse of the convolution operation. This is a, a frequency domain um, a formulation here, what you see, but the rest of this uh, equation shows the regularization term. So we regularize, we need to regularize in order to avoid a noise amplification or in order to adapt to the SNR and, and so on. But here the most uh, critical part or most uh, intuitive part is really this one over P. So P is the Fourier transform of the point spread function. So it's the frequency domain representation of this uh, uh, point spread function. And when we have one over P, then it's the inverse operation. So when we convolve with this uh, P, 
then it is convolution, so it's low pass filter. But when we when we convolve with one over p, it's a it's called deconvolution because it's then um, um, the inverse of this low pass operation. All right. Thank you. Thank you too. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for this very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, the next talk is by uh, Laura Carolina Martinez Esmiral, and she will talk about the problem of low effort reidentification uh, techniques um, for uh, that they can threaten patients' privacy. Um, if you like, you can try to share a screen. Ah, seems to work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do you see it? Yeah, not ma maximized yet, but uh, I guess that's still coming. Yeah. <laughs> Give it a second. Okay, now you should see it. Yeah, now, now we see it full screen. Perfect. So whenever you're ready. Great. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Laura Martinez and I'm a recently graduated master's student. And today I'm going to present a paper called Low Effort Reidentification Techniques Based on Medical Imagery, Threats and Patient Privacy that was written with Professor Andreas U from the University of Salzburg. So the first question that my, one might wonder is why medical images for identification? Well, uh, there are different applications for these images. In particular, we can use them for biometrics. For example, we can use EEG signals as well as ECGs. Also fundus images or images of the vasculature of the eyes can be used for this purpose. And we can also use them for forensics. So imagine in a case where uh, the face or the fingerprints are not recognizable anymore. Then as an alternative, we can use images from the insides of the body for this purpose. In particular, we have seen methods that employ dental hand chest and knee x-rays for this. Uh, furthermore, there are methods that don't, do not have a particular application, but still they are used for identification that employ knee and brain MRIs. For this reason, we thought it would be important to mention them now in this presentation. So um, as you see, we have uh, methods that uh, employ very different uh, images uh, from, from different body parts, but still they have some similarities. In particular, we see that they have a unique and complex pipeline. So each of these methods is focused into a body part. For example, we aim to uh, identify with brain MRIs. Then we have a lot of steps to achieve this goal. The next thing is that uh, we need that alignment. So basically, if we have chest X-rays, uh, the method that employs chest X-rays requires images from the front. It's not okay if they are from the side or from behind. And this happens with all the other methods. And the last thing that they have in common is that they use handcrafted features to achieve the identification, which are basically uh, features created by humans. So basically when we see all of these uh, characteristic, characteristics, we thought, okay, maybe we can create something that is simpler and that achieves the same uh, goal. So basically if right now we have all of these specialized methods, we wanted to instead create a low effort identification method. And the question is, how did we do this? So basically, the first thing was searching for images and selecting them on the internet. After that, we prepared the images that we got, and after that, we applied the methods that we decided to choose. So basically, for searching the images, we started uh, using, like, reflecting, like, what do we need? First of all, we need a data sets that have at least two images per patient, because otherwise, how can we, uh, the, uh, realize if the identification is done correctly or not. The second thing is that we wanted images that had a, a lot of texture. The reason for this is that, as I said before, a previous method used handcrafted features, but instead we wanted to use learned features. So obviously images that have a lot of texture would be a beneficial for the learning of the identification. So basically having these things in mind, we say, okay, let's search. And we found two types of data sets. We found endoscopies and brain MRIs. So basically, um, the reason why we chose these data sets is as follows. So basically for the endoscopies, we say, okay, um, we have never seen any method before that uses endoscopy. So maybe we can demonstrate that with this uh, new method, we can do this. Instead for the brain MRIs, as I explained in the beginning, uh, it is already possible to identify with brain MRIs, but of course it is very um, difficult to do it. Instead, we want to say, okay, maybe with this low effort identification, we have a uh, comparative results. So basically that was the motivation for choosing those types of uh, data sets. So once we had chosen our data sets, we had to prepare them. Basically for the endoscopic data, we did as follows. So basically, as you see, 
we have images that have a lot of noise. So we have this instrument, we have these walls that are very dark, we also have these uh, masks, but any of that is of our interest. What we want only is the walls inside the, the cavities, right? So basically, what we did was individuating the regions of interest. It is possible to do this in, a, in an automatic manner, but for simplicity, we decided to do this manually. So basically, once we had a, found our regions of interest, we divide them into square blocks so that they could be uh, used for the method, right? Instead, for the brain MRI, we could do a very simple automatic method, which is as follows. So basically, we had our original image. We did a global thresholding to get this image. But as you see, it has a lot of noise inside the area. And also we have, you see the skull and also the eyes, which obviously is not uh, relevant for us. So basically we cleaned this image by um, um, applying a series of morphological operations. So basically once these uh, operations were applied, we had our cleaned image. And uh, what we did this was then uh, calculating the largest rectangle inside that area. Once the rectangle was found, uh, we basically um, took the original image, rotated, and cropped it accordingly. So basically, we got our region of interest again, and then the square blocks were extracted from it. So basically, once the data was uh, ready, the next thing was, okay, now let's uh, see what method we can apply for this. So as I said, we were focused on having a learned feature, so we had to apply a deep learning method. So basically, the first thing that we thought about was, what about classification? But classification wouldn't make any sense. Why? Because uh, we are supposed to be doing something that is uh, universal. We don't want to have a closed set of patients. So yeah, I might have 100 patients, 1,000 patients, it doesn't matter. But as soon as I uh, add patient, patient 101, then it's gone. That person won't be identified with that method because the network is not ready for that. So instead, we say, OK, maybe we can use Siamese networks. We tried the simple uh, case where contract, contrast, contrastive loss is used, as well as the one that uses triplet loss, so basically with three images. For both of these, the results were not satisfactory. Because of that, we discarded them, them for this study. So basically, as, um, as soon as we ended our experiments with the Siamese networks, we decided to see if feature extraction could be an alternative, and it was. So basically for feature extraction, we did this. We had our images and basically a network was used to extract the features. Uh, in order to be able to do that, uh, we had to freeze all the layers except the first linear layer. And once this was done, the images were fed to the network and the feature vectors were extracted. Once the feature vectors were ready, they were compared by a Euclidean distance to say, okay, if they are close, they belong to the same patient. Otherwise they are not. However, this wasn't as simple as this, of course, and it's because um, the network that we used was a pre-trained network, in particular, a BGG-16. And as you know, BGG-16 was trained originally on ImageNet. So basically, if we used the BGG-16 as it is, it's not going to work, it's not going to extract relevant features. And uh, because of that, we decided to use instead, no, to use the same uh, network, of course, but to retrain it. Uh, and I forgot to say something. We use a pre-trained network because we didn't have a uh, much data. Uh, we had eight different data sets and for each of them, we tried all of this process, right? And I would say that the data set that had the most quantity of images had around 2000 images. So as you see, it's doing it from scratch wouldn't have made any sense. So as I said, we took the GC16 and retrained it and we did it as follows. So basically we took our data set and divided it into folds. And basically for each fault, we had our training set, that is the one that you see here, and we use it to retrain the pre-trained model. Once the um, model was retrained, a feature extraction was done with the remaining uh, images. After that, the results from the fault were saved, and then for each fault, we did the same, and the average of the, of the faults was calculated. So basically, um, once we had our um, results ready, we used three different metrics to quantize uh, how well the model performed, right? So basically we used accuracy, the false acceptance rate and the false rejection rate. And of course the aim was to have a high, a high accuracy and a low and um, balance false acceptance rate and false rejection rate. So basically in the end, we got these results on average. So basically for each 
a data set, we perform everything. You can see the results, like all the results, the tables in the original paper, but these are the um, average results. As you see, they are not perfect, but they are uh, rather okay, let's say. Um, what we notice also is that um, data sets with uh, low quantities of images were ha had uh, bas bad results, whereas those with more images were higher. So that makes sense, I mean. But still, in any case, what we see here is that identification can be done with very uh, poor resources, as you see. Not perfect, but it can be done. And basically, as we talked in the beginning, this is good because we can use it for biometrics, we can use it for maybe forensic identification, but still, if it falls this uh, methodology into the wrong hands, it could be problematic. Why? Because of the following situation and it's patient privacy. So basically imagine this situation that you see here. So basically my employer asked me for some, from some brain MRIs. They say, okay, I need some, your brain MRIs to hire you. They take my brain MRIs. They say, okay, they are fine, you're hired. But then they say, okay, um, there's this repository in the internet that has brain MRIs. Let's check if this person is inside that repository. They use the identification methods and compare the images that I gave to them and the ones in the repository and they find a match. And of course they realize that I had the disease, I don't know, five years ago. All of this without my consent. And this is a problem because they basically, basically violated my privacy. They know all of this without my permission. So basically this is a very serious problem because uh, the responsibility of this act comes from the researcher who conducted the original study their institution and even the organization that tells the repository. So basically, how can we solve this problem? Because this is a problem. So basically we can do the identification. So right now there exist um, methods that employ generative adversarial networks that basically try to pull an identity classifier to generate images without identity. Um, however, we thought, okay, maybe there could be an alternative where we avoid the creation of synthetic data. And what we propose is the use of disentanglement. So basically we take our images and try to disentangle the images, uh, the, sorry, the features. So basically we say, okay, these are the identity features. Um, now that I have seen them, let's, let, let's extract them and remove them. But of course the question is, is this going to uh, alter the, the diagnosis features? Because otherwise we would be altering a, like, taking away the main uh, purpose of medical images, which is diagnosis. So basically with this open question, I leave you all to think. And for now, I would like to thank you all for your attention. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them now. Yeah, thanks so much for this very interesting talk. Are there any questions? Hi, uh, personally, thank you for your presentation. And so I'd like to ask a question about the feature extraction. Um, so uh, I'm wondering why, why do you only use uh, uh, the image patch from the original image rather than the Intel ROI to extract the features? Since I think uh, maybe the original ROI can contain more useful features, right? Uh, I, I didn't understand the question, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I, I say in your uh, model to extract the, the image features, you only use the image uh, blocks from the original image, right? Yes. So uh, why, do, uh, why don't you just uh, use the original, the whole image? Ah, okay, yes. So the, um, the situation is very simple. I, um, I decided to use blocks in order to have more images. So basically from one image, I got five because otherwise I would have would I have even more more like even smaller data sets. So that was my motivation to do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any further questions? Then maybe I can ask one. I think on slide 11, you um, showed the network and you showed the two samples going into the one. Yes. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. um, 
do they go uh, jointly into the network or do they go separately into the network? They go separately. Ah, okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Ah. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I thought it was very fulfilling. I just had a, one quick question that was mostly at the start. You said that um, at first we were considering some contrastive method, if I recall correctly, and you yes. said that the um, results yes. were not satisfactory. Um, do you have any assumption or explanation as to why you didn't get like the results you were expecting? If I'm honest, I don't. Like they were very low, so I mean, they were, it was even surprising to me to have those results. So. I don't really know what could be the reason for that. All right, thank you. I maybe have a follow-up question for that. Um, could it be that it's too strong augmentation? I mean, the augment I didn't perform any augmentation apart from, from uh, cropping the images. Oh, so, okay. yeah. Interesting, thank you. Okay, any further questions? Last chance. <laughs> Okay, great. Then thank you so much for this interesting talk. And thank you to all the speakers for the interesting talks. And and I think now that